And let's move on. So, huh. so it looks like uh, here we are, you know, have the pen after all. So prop today and prop the Wednesday, we're going to be talking. about functions. So a function is a rule that takes input and you uniquely uh, the only one L in uniquely uniquely assigns them to out which is very fancy sounding, but I think the idea behind this is pretty straightforward. So somebody gave me a number, a whole number, not too big. Uh Let's say when our input is five, our output is 10. Someone gave me another number. Seven. Let's say when our input is seven, our output is 14. Someone gave me a third number. Let's say when our input is three, our output is six. Can you guess if our input is eight, what our output is? 16. So what we have here is we have a rule, which is that the number we give the input, Let's try that again. The input gets doubled. And a function then is just this. I mean, we can certainly have more complicated functions. Let's look at a variation on a theme here. Somebody gave me an input. Another input. A third. I promise there are no wrong inputs. <laughs> um, so, and uh, let's say a four. No. So, can you figure out the rule here? What's this function doing? Multiplying two and then adding two. Multiplying two and then adding two is exactly correct. Thank you. So the rule we have here takes 
the input. Multiply is it by two, then adds two. And most of the functions we work with sort of in day-to-day, -day, in day-to-day -day algebra, I guess I should say, rather than day-to-day -day life, look like this. Our input is some number, our function does something to that input. But um, we can have, you know, functions in real life where the inputs and outputs might not all be numbers. Let's look at a slightly different function. Someone gave me a number between zero and a hundred. <clears throat> an input of 23 gives an output of f, another number. One. An input of one also gives an output of f, another number. Equal seven. <laughs> A more optimistic number. 96. 96 is an output of a. So, What's this function doing? Can I do one more number? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 22. Yeah, maybe. Uh, is it like a grading system? It's a grading system. A percentage grade on number goes in. But when I enter grades into the grade book, I mean into our grading system, I can't give it a number, I have to give it a letter. So we need a function that takes as its input the percentage that the student got and gives as its output the number that I'll actually feed to my CSC. Yeah. Um, Similarly, I mean, it's easy to think of all sorts of functions in day-to-day -day life. I mean, if you go to a restaurant, you can have as it's the input, the food you order. And you can have as the output a cost, for example. Um, stuff like Uber is making this ancient example sort of seem a little creepy, but if you order a taxi, you can have as your input the number of miles the taxi is going to take you, and you can have as your output once again the cost. So functions are everywhere, in the classroom, out of the classroom. And this section is um, interested in giving some definitions, and then it's interested in giving notation, and it's interested in giving a few different ways of looking at functions. So a fair amount of material, I think, which is why I think it's going to take two days to cover. 
So, let's go back to this and let's pick a word out of this um, definition and let's talk about it a little more. Let's talk about that word you would need to read. So, to be a function, every input can only have one output. And this is something that I think we expect from most day-to-day -day situations. I mean, you as a student have a right to expect that I am using a consistent grading scale. It would be a problem if an 85% could either be a B or a C, depending on my mood, for example. So, this is a pretty natural requirement. Again, I mean, this kind of creaky example, but most taxi websites will tell you their rate. Right. You know, you have a right to expect that if you get taken 20 miles, you'll be charged whatever the rate they say and not some different number. If you and your friend order the exact same food at a restaurant, you should be charged the same amount. So it's a very natural thing to expect from most real world situations. And it's something that we're going to see in algebra as well. When we start writing down equations and messing with equations. This does have a few kind of interesting um, implications in the math side of things. For example, let's take, let's define a function whose input of one gives an output of one, an input of four, an output of two, nine, an output of three, 16, an output of four. So this function is, well, what's this function doing? That's an interesting observation, and it's a true observation. It's not quite what we're looking for. We want to think, you know, remember that a function is a rule that takes an input and assigns it to an output. So it's not a I mean, I mean, yes, what you said is true. It's a kind of, it's probably overcomplicating this. It's probably easier to think that what you're doing is taking a root. 
the output is the square root of the input. So this is just my experience with square roots, but when a square root first sort of gets presented to students, it's presented as, you know, the square root of a number is the positive of a number I'm going to, let's say, let's give this number a name. The square root of a number B is a positive number, which we write as the square root of b, we give it that symbol such that this number squared equals b. So the square root of nine is three because three squared equals nine and also because Three is positive. We need both those things. We need this positivity condition. And as a child, uh, what I did not understand, and which none of my teachers would really prepare to explain to me, is why we do it this way. What's wrong with just saying that the square root of nine is both three and negative three? Why do we insist on this positivity? And the answer is because if we let the square root of nine both be three and negative three, this rule we have is no longer a function. The input nine has two different outputs. So let's talk a little about ways that functions are traditionally presented. There are maybe three or four kind of very famous ways of thinking about functions. Um, actually, before I do that, let's finish with the definitions. So, A function <clears throat> takes inputs and assigns them to outputs. However, some inputs might break. 
the function. So let's go back to this frame and let's give as an input negative four. So the output should be the square root of negative four and maybe Maybe some of you have stumbled across the imaginary or complex numbers, but we're going to say that the square root of negative four is not defined. Any number times itself is positive, so we can only take the square root of positive numbers. I guess I should say non-negative numbers to be perfectly correct. So, for example, the square root function can only take Positive inputs. Again, I guess I really should say non negative because the square root of zero is zero. But, you know, we can't take the square root of a negative number. So, most of the functions we look at, you know, in math classes have inputs and outputs that are numbers. So in any event, the domain of a function is the, let's say, allowable inputs. So the inputs that do not break the function. So, for example, the domain of the square root function is the non negative numbers. We can only take the square root of the non-negative numbers. And this sort of gets at one of the standard ways of thinking about functions, which is that you have two big boxes of numbers, and then you've got arrows assigning elements of one box to elements of another box. So we've got two boxes and they're full of numbers. And one is being sent to one, and nine is being sent to three, and four is being sent to two, and you know, five is being sent to something. Let me square root 
of five. I mean, it's going to be some ugly decimal, but five's being set to 2.236. So this is a representation, once again, of the, yeah, let's, uh, let's try that U a second time. It's a representation of the square root function. And we can say that an arbitrary input, x, is being sent to the square root of x. So we have a bin of numbers over here and a bin of numbers over here. And the bin of numbers over here, the things whose square roots we can take, this is called the domain. And now I'm going to introduce uh, two definitions. This is this has always been a little odd to me. Maybe it will be a little odd to you. Does anybody know offhand what the bin over here is called? Okay, that's fine. So The bin over here, we're going to call the codomain. And maybe this does not at the moment seem very weird to you, except that the codomain, you know, in the context of an algebra class, or even like a calculus class, or any class you could be called upon to teach, the codomain is always going to be the same. The codomain is always going to be called O of the real numbers. So why do I think this is strange? Well, Let's keep with the square root example. We've got our domain, and then we've got our codomain. And again, Our codomain is all of the real numbers. And we've got the domain, and the domain is not all of the real numbers. The domain is the numbers whose square root we can take. It's the numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. And we've got, again, you know, the fact that we put that as an example, zero goes to zero, one goes to one, four goes to two. In general, X goes to the square root of X. Now the codomain is all of the real numbers. So 
Negative five is sitting there in the codomain. But negative five can never be a square root. Because, where are we here? Because the way we've defined the square root, square roots are always positive. So there isn't any number in the domain that gets sent to negative five. So we have this codomain, but then we have these numbers in the codomain that aren't, aren't touched by the function. So our codomain gets split into two, and we give a second definition. the range of a function is, is, that's, that's right, the set of numbers in the codomain that are mapped to by the function. So here, two is in the range because four is set to two. But negative five is not in the range. because nothing is sent to negative five. And I'm not totally certain sort of what the history of this is. I mean, it seems like what you could do is to say, okay, we have all the real numbers here, and we have all the real numbers here, and this function is only defined for some real numbers here and only some of the real numbers here are outputs. So we can have the codomain and the range. Yeah, terrible notation. So we can have the codomain and the range. And then we can give this big set a name, and we can give this small set a name, just like we do over here. That's what it seems to me the most natural thing to do would be. It would save the symmetry of the situation, but it's not what we do. 
So we have this sort of goofy situation where we have this thing called the codomain, but the codomain is always the same. It's always the real numbers. So it never really matters to us. And really we talk about the domain and the range in practice. When I when I asked if any of you had um, if any of you knew what this set over to the right was called, I was thinking maybe someone would suggest the range. So in practice, the domain is the inputs. And the range is the outputs. Any questions on this material so far? Then we should introduce some kind of notation because we want to be able to talk about um, functions compactly. You know, if we have a rule that doubles a number and then adds two to it, we don't want to have to write out the doubling and then adding two functions. So we want compact notation. We give functions names. And in a purely algebra, just purely abstract setting, the most common name we give a function is f, short for function. And then if we need another name, we sort of count up. So in practice, um, f, g, and h are the names we're going to see a lot if you crack open an algebra textbook. Um, in, in real world problems, in applied problems, we usually give functions names that, that give the reader some clue as to what the function is doing. Like we might have a rule that takes as its input the radius of a circle and gives as its output the area. And we might name this function A or capital. A, to represent what this function is doing, to represent that it's the area function. And if we've given our function a name, let's use F. If our input is called X, our output is called F parenthesis X end parenthesis. And when you're reading that out loud, you read it F of X. So let's go back to 
to the square root. And when our input, let's say our input for the square root function is four, so our output is two. The square root of four equals two. Another way of writing this is that f of four equals two. Our input in parentheses is four. Our output is true. Let's talk a little more about this. Um, so keeping with, again, keeping with the square root, well, as I say, this is going to take more than today to talk about. We are going to look at examples that aren't the square root, but keeping with the square root for now, if our input is some number x, our output is the square root of x. And we write f of x equals the square root of x. Um, 